Okay, hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webinar, Tips for Cross-Curricular Coding at Your School. My name is Kevin Hogan. I am the editor at large for eSchool News, and I'm excited to have you join us for what should be a very informative session. Today's webinar is sponsored by Unruly Studios. Unruly is a STEM learning company that combines coding with active play and social emotional learning. Their flagship product, Unruly Splats, are programmable four buttons that students code using an iPad or Chromebook to tell splats when to light up, make sounds, or collect points when they are stomped on. Using block-based coding, students code the rules to create games like whack-a-mole, relay races, memory challenges, and dance competitions. They also offer a fully virtual platform that doesn't require physical splats for coding and for play. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to take a minute to go over some of the features of the platform that we're using for this webinar. Today's event will be recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with the PDF of the slides. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A box. There will be time at the end of this presentation for our speakers to also address these questions. Uh, use the chat function uh, by clicking on chat to feel free to use this feature to contact someone from eSchool News if you have a technical question, but please don't use this to ask questions of the speaker. Uh, just use the Q&A box for that. So with these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started with our presentation. Today, our presenters are Corey Glassman, I'm sorry, Corey Gleesman, Assistant Professor of Computer Science Education at Tennessee Tech University, and Lauren Watkins. And Lauren is the marketing lead at Unruly Splats. Dr. Gleesman has multi multidisciplinary research experience in computer science education and mathematics education. His research agenda reflects a commitment to understanding and improving computer science education for novice educators and combining computer science and play. Uh, recently, he has developed a new graduate and undergraduate computer science education endorsement program for Tennessee Tech. This program is the first approved K-12 computer science education program in the state of Tennessee. And Lauren, as I mentioned, is the marketing lead for Unruly. Uh, before coming to Unruly, she worked in the 3D printing industry at Pinshape and Form Labs. Uh, she's a passionate techie, loves working with educators to make STEM and technology more fun and physically active for kids. So at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Lauren, to, to, give, to begin the presentation, and we'll be back a little bit later for the Q&A session. Over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having us on here today. I'm super excited to be here and talk about um, cross-curricular coding with Corey here. Um, but before we get started, we're going to launch a quick poll uh, just to sort of acknowledge it's been a crazy year. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how crazy does this school year feel so far? Uh, we're going to launch a poll shortly. Awesome. Let us know. We'll give you like 20 seconds or so just to respond. And then we'll share the results. <laughs> I know what we've been hearing from a lot of our educators that unruly is, you know, 12, <laughs> 13. So uh, acknowledging that it's been, uh, it's been a crazy year and, um, but we've seen some really creative ideas and creative solutions. Uh, how has things been going for you so far this year, Corey? Yeah, it has been crazy. I mean, the transition um, into either hybrid or completely virtual learning um, is a steep one. Um, and there's a, there's a big learning curve, especially with a lot of the educators I work with um, and even myself taking content that you're normally used to teaching in person um, and then making it authentic um, and accessible uh, to all of your uh, students and learners um, isn't always the easiest. So yeah, I could I can see where we're going with our answers here, um, and see the trend that I've been I've been hearing as well from all the, the teachers I work with. I'm encouraged that there's some people who put uh, six and and seven yeah. on the lower end, <laughs> though though many people have put between eight to ten. So you were felt, you were heard. And yeah. then one more question: um, Are you virtual, hybrid, or in person right now? Um, let us know in the poll that we'll be launching shortly right here. Awesome. 
And it's interesting just to know because in uh, I'm I'm based in Boston right now, and um, many of our schools uh, started out hybrid and now have moved completely virtual. So um, yeah, lots of lots of new ideas around you know how to engage your students during virtual learning. We'll be digging into some of that today, but everything that we talk about will be um, applicable for both virtual, hybrid, and in person. All right, we'll give a few more seconds, and then we'll share the results. Awesome. Looks like most people are virtual, but definitely a mix of hybrid. I know we had in Boston, um, some of the higher needs students got to be in person for the first half, but now they're all virtual. So, all right, thank you so much for sharing everybody. So we're gonna, we're gonna jump in. So what is block-based coding and how does it relate to teaching STEM subjects, Corey? This is sort of your area of expertise. So just sort of give us the quick uh, background on it. Yeah, so this is what I do daily. I'm working with um, either students or novice teachers. I call them pre-service teachers and then some in-service teachers that um, maybe reject uh, technology usage or they don't believe that they themselves can be coders. Um, and in just probably about five years ago when, is when I started picking this up and really researching it. Um, and I found that even the um, lay person can understand computer science and often computer science um, is miscategorized as just a coding skill where computer science in general is really a problem solving method is a way of thinking, um, looking at the world around you. And we're gonna break that down today. Um, I've kind of come up with a method based off of a few research projects that I've worked on. Um, and I've really looked at uh, the user, what teachers are doing, um, how they are viewing computer science in their classroom. And uh, we'll talk about it in practical and logical terms. So even if you don't believe that you are a coder or you could teach in this um, kind of this method, uh, you will be able to, and I hope by the end of this presentation, you get, you get some clarity on how to do that. And we'll pair it with some very innovative technologies. Um, and then we'll talk about splats uh, um, today. And it's a, it's a great tool to do this type of practical teaching. Um, but what is coding? So if we think about it um, in uh, just basic terms and conceptualize it that way, it's really just a system of symbols. Um, we have a system of symbols that we communicate with um, every day. It's the English language. Um, we place meaning, and we'll talk about this um, symbolic interactionism um, a little bit later, but this concept is that we place meaning behind um, letters. So the way that letters are sequenced together makes us believe um, or think of something um, or visualize something. So the word dog, um, or let's, if we look at those three letters, D-O-G, um, the way that they're sequenced and the like sounds and phonemes we put behind those letters make us think of um, a canine, right? A furry little canine. Um, but as teachers, um, we can do the same thing with coding um, and how actual code is sequenced together can help us visualize different concepts. And we're gonna look at some cross-curricular ones today. So it can be complex, like what you see on the right-hand side there. Um, this is what normal people think of when they see coding, um, a lot of text um, and, it may be difficult to look at this and understand what is going on, but we're gonna break this down and block-based programming um, is a great way to do that. So um, if you compare that past um, image with this new image, um, which is the block-based programming on the right and left-hand side, you can actually um, differentiate block-based programming as well. Um, you can have it uh, maybe a little bit more um, basic I mean, easy to follow and it can be very complex. Um, but block-based programming um, is the same as a normal coding language um, where the blocks and how they are sequenced represent a certain meaning. And it has drag and drop functionality that makes programming accessible um, to even students who maybe don't have the um, motor skills for typing yet. Um, so what I use it for is um, actually conceptualizing CS concepts um, for, it can be adults, um, I'm working sometimes with uh, graduate um, students who are in-service teachers coming back to their masters, um, and they love this type of programming. Um, and they come into my class and like this, I don't know if I can do this. And then I show them some videos of uh, first graders doing block-based programming. And I'm like, if they can do it, you can do it as well. 
Um, so you can see on the right hand side in that top picture, um, it's four simple blocks placed together. Um, this is um, Splat's block-based programming language. So when you click one Splat, um, the Splat will turn green. It will play a Splat sound, and then it will increase um, by an interval of one um, a score. And on that right-hand side, you can actually see um, there's multiple chunks of code happening all at once, um, and it has one trigger uh, that causes those um, three pieces of code to happen. That's actually called parallelism. We'll get into more of the concepts. Um, and I see actually it's popping up in my chat. I can, I, I'll try to answer some of the questions, um, but isn't this similar to Scratch? Yes, it is. There are a lot of block-based programming platforms out there. Each of them have some of their own unique concepts, um, but we'll talk about really why they're all the same. A lot of the concepts used in block-based programming are the same exact concepts that are used um, in any text-based program. Um, and so it can be a complex, like a C++ program that you're using. A lot of the same concepts um, are used in block-based programming. We're gonna hit that in a second. Yeah, and I actually had no experience coding when I started at Unruly Splat. So block-based coding was how I learned. And I can say it is a lot of fun. And um, that was very astute observation. It's, it is similar to Scratch and actually one of the, um, co-inventors of Scratch is a, a advisor on our team and helped co-invent uh, Splats as well. So that's why it looks similar. And so where did this all begin? Um, actually, it was a fun fact when we were talking um, mm -hmm. with the CEO, uh, Brienne Lemon, um, who is the, the founder of uh, Unruly Splats. She said that um, she first used programming languages um, when she came across logo programming. And so that was actually the, uh, we're gonna do like a little a historical, um, <laughs> like recap some history of uh, block-based programming and educational programming. Um, but I first was interested in programming when I read Mindstorms um, when I was uh, in my master's degree and I was working um, at schools teaching mathematics. Um, and uh, Seymour Paper uh, wrote this, he was a mathematician. Um, he was actually, um, Mitch Resnick, who is the founder of Scratch that you just referenced, it was his um, PhD advisor. Um, and so you can see where there's kind of a lineage of these ed tech programmers and how this all happened. Um, but he created, he wrote this book, Mindstorms, which is, was about students embodying mathematics um, through programming micro worlds. Um, and so a micro world was just a place where students could go, leave the actual physical world and interact with um, concepts and blocks um, that represented different types of mathematical concepts um, in that virtual world. They could take themselves out of that physical world and really start to um, embody uh, what was happening on the screen. And he created logo programming. And so that was what uh, Brienne used. I think it was her first um, experience with programming. She said it was the exact same picture on that right hand side. And it was called Logo Turtle. It was a turtle that moved around. It actually began, it started as a just a a V, um, a green V that would move around the screen. Um, but it was the same exact ideas. Um, and that's where teacher education efforts um, were actually, uh, were focused. Um, so they started using this programming language in schools and you can see some of those pictures. That's uh, Seymour Paper. And then um, we have uh, some of the students actually using the, the programming language for the first time. We just asked somebody who said they had to take off, but just to let everyone know, we will be recording this. So uh, if you can't say the whole time, we can send you the recording. And so this goes back to, uh, this is an old, old paper, um, a research paper that uh, back in 1966, and it's, um, it referenced this idea of um, the boheme jokatini theorem, where three structures of programming kind of make up all programming languages and anything in, uh, that can be built um, using either block-based programming or text-based programming. And these three control structures that they reference are sequence control, repetition control, and selection control. They take different, um, these concepts take different forms depending on what language you're using, but uh, the actual foundational concept um, is in all of these programming languages that we use. And we're going to talk about some other frameworks that expand on this, but it goes back to my point of um, even if you're not an expert programmer, you can think in computer science terms. 
And that's one of the goals of teachers nowadays. And that's what we're asking them to do with all of these new computer science standards is you don't have to teach concrete programming all day long. It's more of a way of thinking and understanding what these control structures mean. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that we always like to emphasize too is that you know we're not trying to necessarily create an army of young programmers, though that would be, some of them will be, and that's great. But like Corey said, it's really just about learning the skills that you need, just like you know basic math and biology that you will need in any career path that your students do. So. Um, you know, can't stress enough that this is a skill that is kind of essential, we believe, to, um, to all students. So we, we touched a little bit on the computational thinking aspect, sort of how does that connect with block coding and why is it important? Yeah, so I use computational thinking as a way um, to bridge um, CS with our actual mandated standardized curriculum. Um, that we're teaching every day. And there's a reason I do this. Um, and I, I think I put in a further slide is that we don't want this type of um, activity or this type of learning to just be an add-on to our um, curriculum. We already have as teachers so much um, packed into our day um, that if you ask, hey, you need to spend now an hour to teach computer science, um, which is, I think we're actually navigating that way a little bit with some of the new policies and standards that are coming out in each state. Um, however, um, I think um, our time is much more well spent if we can see um, practical ways to cross cut computer science or computation, computer science with our actual academic standards. And the way that I have found um, just through my research and various um, iterations of um, classes that I've taught is that computational thinking um, is a great way to do this. So what is computational thinking? Um, it's actually larger than computer science. It's larger than all of these disciplines. Um, I almost categorize it in a way of critical thinking and problem solving, except it's a little bit more well-defined than those. Um, so um, Google um, runs this course, it's called Computational Thinking for Educators, and they define it as a problem solving um, process that includes a number of characteristics and dispositions. CT is essentially um, or is essential to the development of computer applications, but it is also used to support problem solving across dis disciplines. Um, so it's humanities, math, and science. So you can see that interdisciplinary approach. Um, this is my definition um, that I articulate to uh, my teachers and I give them um, a really good um, example of this. So CT is about understanding what the problem is and how to develop solution pathways in a logical manner rather than depending solely on the manipulation of a technology to arrive at the solution. If you've ever used, my background's in math education, um, and if you've ever used Wolfram Alpha or uh, even a calculator, and you have your students use them, and they, they just understand what buttons they need to hit at what specific time to give them an answer, or to give them a very good estimated guess. Um, but they don't understand that there may be multiple solution pathways to reach that solution. That's the type of computational thinking I aim for. And it's our job as, our, as teachers to create those environments and create those educational environments. I think a teacher is a designer essentially. Um, and if we can design a environment that promotes computational thinking, um, that's one that uh, I think is better than that rote memorization piece. And so why is this all important? Where did I get computational thinking from? I didn't just grab it out of uh, my back pocket and say, hey, I think this is really um, important. It's actually being integrated into all of our um, standards and some of the recommendations that are being placed on not only computer science teachers, um, but all STEM teachers. And so this came from the next generation science standards, which I know are big and many of you probably referenced them, um, but they want all elementary and secondary teachers um, to integrate computer science. Um, and they're actually now pushing. So in my realm of the world in teacher education, we are now being forced to uh, teach the next generation of teachers um, how to teach in this manner. So uh, um, it's being pushed on, on, on kind of all levels um, of education um, is, hey, we need to help our students think computationally because technology will always be changing. Um, but if we can promote this type of thinking, it's not going to matter what technology there is. We're going to be able to understand how to arrive at different solutions um, through the manipulation of technology, but actually understand the concepts. 
And so I first arrived at uh, this idea of, hey, how can I connect my everyday content? I was working with math um, with my computer science technologies that I was using. And I was actually using Scratch at the beginning. Um, and I was teaching a whole course on block-based programming for educators. And I said, um, and a lot of them were math teachers and they were saying, I wanna teach this specific content, but I want to also use um, my, uh, my Scratch technology. And so I started researching and looking into different ways that um, people were conceptualizing Scratch and the founder, Mitch Resnick, um, he wrote this paper with Brennan in 2012, and this is when I found it, um, that said, hey, these are seven computational thinking concepts inherent in my um, block-based programming language. So you remember we talked about those three control structures before in the bohemian jokatini theorem. Um, there's, they kind of are elaborating on them here, where we have sequence, looping, and conditionals. Um, those were the same three that were um, actually inherent in um, that original Jokopini theorem. And um, I started to do a lot of research and I'll, I'll share, I've shared my uh, paper. I started to do research on what are the logical and practical ways of connecting a math standard and concept um, with the CS technology. And the way we did it was actually um, by pairing the math concept with a computational thinking standard that was happening in the CS tech. On the left-hand side, these are more general um, that aren't just tied to a specific block-based programming language, um, but pattern recognition is very similar to sequencing. When you decompose something, it's very similar to maybe extracting data or, or looking at the events um, that are happening, happening, algorithmic thinking and abstraction. Um, these are four kind of more general computational thinking concepts that teachers can use as well. And so to give you an idea of how I attack this is I like to, here's just a, a basic Venn diagram, but it gives you um, a good picture of how I try to attack um, the um, cross-curricular method. Um, and so I will take, I'll have my students, they'll, they'll take their content that they're teaching. If it's computer science, that's great. Um, if they're computer science teachers, then this is a little bit um, simpler, but if they are math or science or English or social studies teachers, um, and I'm even now with my use of Scratch looking into uh, physical education. So whatever content they're teaching is in that yellow sphere. And we'll look at block-based programming and hey, we, we really like certain technologies um, that pair well with my class and engage them. Where can I find a computational thinking concept which bridges my actual content in the programming language. And uh, there's different connections that can be made. There can be some more superficial connections, which I call simple ones. And there can be some complex connections where um, the content enhances the programming and the programming enhances the content. Um, and so learning is enhanced. They're not just both there in the, the lesson just because they have to be there. We've seen actually, you know, as far away as music teachers that are you know introducing block coding especially now when they have to get creative if they're not able to sing or play instruments you know using uh block programming to create musical notes and then we've also seen pe teachers as well incorporating uh computer science into their lessons so it's been really really awesome to see the just the different subjects that you wouldn't think have any relation to computer science and then the overlap that they're able to make so sort of what are the benefits of, we've, we've touched on a little bit, but what are the benefits of incorporating computer science into other, um, you know, STEM or non-STEM related subjects? Yeah, and I'll give you uh, three major benefits that I see. Um, one is that it enables um, constructionism and constructivism. So uh, really, we'll uh, tackle constructivism first, but that's just the theory that learners construct their own knowledge rather than passively taking that information. And that kind of ties in really nicely with my definition of computational thinking. Instead of just um, passively using a technology to receive the answer, we're now enabling the students to construct their own knowledge um, by manipulating the technology um, and understanding the problem solving pathways, um, which is important, um, but it's our job as teachers to create those types of environments. And the first step is kind of looking at that Venn diagram and saying, okay, what, how do I want my students to think? 
Um, it's almost like thinking about thinking, that metacognition that we do as teachers. Um, but let's find logical and practical ways to do that. It promotes conceptual understanding and critical thinking. Um, oh, back, jump back up to constructionism. Um, the reason why um, learners are able to construct their own knowledge is because they are actually constructing things themselves. Um, they're using these blocks, they're placing them in different sequences um, to understand a concept. So it all ties back to that idea of um, social interaction, um, symbolic interactionism, where different sequences of blocks are put together to give ourselves a meaning, similar to the word dog that we talked about. Um, it makes us think of a specific concept where the use of specific blocks in those computational thinking concepts will lead us maybe to understand um, a biology concept more or to think about um, maybe uh, multiplication or um, skip counting, something like that. Um, those are the type of learning um, environments we're looking to create. And the last, I mentioned this a little bit before, but um, the benefit of including computer science into your actual teaching. Um, so if you are a math teacher or a science teacher or any type of teacher in the STEM field and, and you're, you're tasked with teaching uh, really one discipline, uh, the good thing I think about using this cross-curricular approach is you're using technology um, as something for cognition instead of something more required of learners and of yourself. Um, you don't want to make your job necessarily harder um, and I'm not asking you to be an expert programmer. I'm asking you to think about some of the practical ways that you can integrate technology um, into your teaching that isn't a burden on you. If you're not taking more time out of your day, um, this will be an engaging engaging way to, uh, to really enhance your teaching. And uh, this hits on that second bullet point. This was one of my um, participants. I use pseudonyms here, but uh, this is some um, qualitative data from one of my studies. Um, it references the uh, the math teachers that I, I was talking about. Um, it was an elementary teacher that was focused on making a math lesson using block-based programming. And she said that block-based programming can be used to help students have a deeper understanding of mathematics. They can learn about why an equation works the way it does and not just memorize it. I feel like block-based programming and computational thinking um, is a good is good with broad concepts that a lot of people never understood as to why they are happening. Um, so that gives you some good insight into how teachers are really thinking about computational thinking and programming paired with the content of math. You can switch that um, discipline to any discipline that you're, you're interested in, um, but conceptual understanding and critical thinking and learning is in every type of discipline. So um, this sentiment can, can echo in all, all spheres. We just got a question from Dave uh, for specific examples of how to use splats in science, math, social studies. We're going to get into this in a little bit. So hold that question and we will get back to it at the end. But I just wanted to make sure I, I see your question and, and it's a good one. So we will get to it. And I'm curious to just to ask everybody in the audience, sort of maybe write us in the chat and just let us know what is your experience with computer science so far? Have you played around with Scratch? What kinds of activities have you done? Be interested to hear how, um, how you have, or maybe have not yet uh, incorporated computer science or computational thinking into your classes. And while we wait for people to do that, let's kind of talk about the, what does it look like and the specific examples now that we've talked about sort of the high level, um, you know, why is it important and what are the benefits yeah. everyone's bought in? What does it look like? Yeah, I did my uh, sales pitch to you early and now I'm gonna <laughs> give you some actual concrete examples of uh, what my students have produced. Um, I'll get into one that I'm using in my class right now, um, the flat, and it's funny you mentioned Scratch. I'm gonna show you some of those examples. Um, I talked about different connections. I call this a complex connection. So, um, and you don't have to read this whole uh, excerpt, but you can see that my students um, had a, it's actually helpful to read that first line. So the, I had a, um, a young female, Olivia, she um, actually had her students code a clock so that they could understand how uh, the small hand and the large hand um, worked together. So what, were, what was uh, their relationship? Um, and I like this connection because it enhances the learning um, of uh, time. So their standard was understanding um, the 
um, analog clock. And what it really did is the coding enhanced the math and the math enhanced the coding. So they used the computational thinking concept um, of looping, you can see there, as the repeat. And she said it, the difficult part was discovering uh, the code for the clock. I had to figure out that one minute equals six degrees. Um, so that was hard. After I figured it out, um, writing the lesson and teaching it was much easier. Um, and so I'm looking through a lens of teacher education. How do my teachers understand this? Um, but this could be a, an activity that you give to your students as well. Um, and there's different ways. I'm going to give you some tips on how to construct this type of lesson. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see this was also a uh, another, she went through some iterations of design um, and she started out by looking at a unit circle. Um, okay, how can I work with a unit circle? Um, what are the degrees of a unit circle? How does that look like on the, on the actual block-based programming platform? And eventually she, she came to this idea of, of programming a clock. Um, but this whole design is really looking at, okay, what computational thinking concepts can I use that equate directly to the math concept? Um, so she was able to find out that that six degrees that she looped it so many times was equivalent to that one minute. And now how can I describe the relationship between the, the hands of a clock? And another example is, um, this is in that scratch language, but you can do very similar things with, uh, with your splats because as you mentioned, it's very similar block-based programming languages. Um, this uh, teacher actually had her students uh, program a place value house where once a value of nine is reached in the one spot, um, then the 10 spot increases by a value of one. And so the reason why this, what computational thinking concept this used, um, if I were to give you a test, um, I never really gave you the definitions of all of them, but it is a conditional. Um, so a conditional is a logic statement, like an if then statement. So if the one's value is greater than nine, then the tens place increases by one. That's the concept that the students had to use. And you could see that the block-based programming paired with the conditional um, computational thinking concept enhanced the understanding of place value, which is the math concept. Um, and so this is the, the, the method I, I'm trying to uh, instill and hopefully you buy into it a little bit, but it gives you a practical way and really a, uh, a model for how you can, you can do this in your own classroom. We have some questions too coming in from um, from people who are using things like this, but said that their colleagues might feel hesitant. Lauren may have dropped out. Yep. That <clears throat> true, Kevin? Okay. Yeah, that's always the way, isn't it, Corey? No, that's okay. I, I haven't not. seen some of the teachers are more oh. that advanced. She's back. You're back. And she might be gone. Oh, she's gone. <laughs> it's okay. I will. Uh, I will carry I, on. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Try again, Lauren. Oh, I was just going to say, do you have any tips for uh, anyone who's looking to work with a colleague who maybe is a little bit hesitant to get into the computer science coding? Yes, 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 I do. I will. Uh, I have a slide that is. Um, tied into that specifically. It gives you some concrete ways to, to do this, but um, my first suggestion would be to examine um, a programming language and see what type of concepts are inherent in it. Um, there's a lot of pre-made curriculum out there, which is great. Find that pre-made curriculum, but then analyze it um, and see, okay, where can I find a computational thinking concept that ties to my standards that I wanna teach for this lesson? Um, and I'm going to give you some lesson design tips a little later, um, so stay with us. Um, and there's about seven that will will help you navigate navigate this process. And even for, I, I have teachers that walk in that have no programming background and they use these tips. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so this is another example. This is actually we're going to do this one. I'm going to try to if we have enough time, I'm going to show this as a uh, example at the end. But this is using the Splats programming language and it's creating a pedometer. Um, I'm using this with my classroom right now. Um, and I'll I'll this is a good example of maybe a uh, a way that you can integrate this into your classroom. Um, download a pre-made project that Splats has. Understand it yourself. 
and then limit the number of blocks. So I'll give this to my teachers and I'll say, I want you to create a pedometer using the blocks on the left hand side. Um, I have already um, applied some of the settings that I want on those blocks. So I don't have to get into the um, maybe the nitty gritty of what how the stopwatch works or uh, how to necessarily change your color light. Um, but what I've tried to focus on here is the if do else block. It's those orange blocks, which is a conditional similar to that um, place house that I spoke of. Um, if you step on the, the way this works is on, I'll show you the pedometer, you, you click start and you run on two squads for 10 seconds and it counts your score. Um, but if you run out of time, then something will happen. Your splats will turn red um, and it'll make a sound and it won't allow you to um, collect any more points. So it's an if then statement similar to that place house. Um, but what I have students do, and um, I had a, a great one the other day is they connected to, they connected this activity, um, the if then uh, to um, multiples. So they were looking at, okay, maybe every time I step on the block, I will increase my value by five. So what are my multiples of five? Or if I do this for 10 seconds and I receive a score of 15 steps in 10 seconds, um, what if I ran without actually doing another trial, um, how many steps could I take in 17 seconds? Um, that's kind of a, a higher level thinking, um, but you could have your students run a trial and see, um, or you can actually have them kind of equate this and and try to come up with an equation to figure that out. Yeah, I love the competitive aspect of this too, because you know, you'll see right away your kids' eyes light up, uh, you know, when they get to say, like, okay, how many stomps can you do in 15 seconds? And then, you know, Sally over there beats Johnny, and then he's like, All right, I gotta, I gotta try this again. So um, that's another great aspect of just sort of working in that physical activity with it. Uh, we had a question from Gwen about non-splat online options. So I think the example that Corey gave before was with Scratch, uh, which is open source and it's non-splat related as well. And he's about to also go over another example here, which is also Scratch. Yeah. However, uh, splats do have that online version um, where you actually don't need the physical um, splat um, to uh, use this tool. Um, and maybe Lauren can hit this at the end a little bit, how that, how that might work on that platform. Um, but you don't necessarily need the physical tool. Um, this example um, is actually using, uh, it is using Scratch, but I will have my students um, code a knock-knock joke. If you wanted to change this, um, you could say uh, to code a haiku um, if you're an English teacher or something along those lines where um, you're really connecting it to the ELA concept or standard or topic that you want. Um, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll give, I'll show them the actual solution. Hey, here's my knock knock joke that I coded. If we had time today, I would pull that up and show you, but I'll, I'll limit their blocks. That's one of the lesson design tips I have is it really um, scaffolds the process for the learner. Um, and then I'm able to also differentiate it um, based on uh, the student's abilities. So if you actually look in that last pedometer um, slide, you can actually create a pedometer with four blocks. Um, you saw there was a lot more blocks in that last slide, but if I have some novice programmers, um, I'll give them the challenge of, hey, you need to do this with four blocks, and then I'll increase it and say, okay, now let's try um, with these 11 blocks because there's different ways to solve the problem, which is what computational thinking is about, not just the one way that I'm gonna show you how. Um, but as teachers, we need to understand those processes and um, pathways first. Awesome. And so why infuse playfulness into learning? Sort of one of the benefits of that playfulness and telling a joke and, you know, doing silly things. Yeah, so um, this is through research. I actually worked, um, we'll talk about this in a minute, but I worked with uh, robots when I first started using block-based programming. Um, and one reason I really enjoy Scratch is because it takes the actual physical robot out of um, the environment and allows the student to almost embody the coding themselves, if that makes sense. Um, and so here's some just literature that I've kind of uh, conceptualized that have allowed me to, to really realize why play is important. So it's critical for like social development skills um, and cognitive development, it's been proven. 
um, that symbolic interactionism that we spoke about, um, we're now using the blocks instead of just a language or um, instead of like the sequence of maybe a language or a written paragraph to um, transfer a concept to the learner. We're now using the blocks and hopefully the sequence of blocks, if we do this correctly, um, will lead the learner to seeing different concepts. Um, and then here's where you can find kind of a gap in the literature. So research indicates that play leads to positive effects on language development, but it doesn't consistently show positive impact on problem solving and self-regulation skills. So that's the negative side of play is that it doesn't always show the positive impacts on problem solving. However, block-based programming has been shown to be a viable motivating um, tool uh, for learners and it helps them develop the problem solving skills. It increases their fluency in different content areas. It improves their logical thinking process. So if we pair these two, play within a, a more structured environment through block-based programming, we can then increase their problem solving while also working on those um, like self-regulation skills and those social development cognitive skills. We also find play is a great reward because all kids love to play. And so if you, you know, get them, they know that, okay, I have to do code this thing so that I get to play the game. Um, that's always exciting. Uh, so quick question for the audience, uh, write us in the chat. How are you incorporating playfulness into your classes? Um, if at all, any ideas? Uh, tips, things that you've liked, uh, things that you didn't like, uh, write this in the chat. And so what are some examples of using playfulness to introduce coding to students? You gave us a ton, um, but I think you have some more notes to share here. Yeah, so um, this was, I actually had my students um, code an animal, um, their pet. So they would code their pet to play and eat, and they use the concept of data and variables um, to increase their hungry score or decrease their hungry score. And we tied this to just the, the simple um, second grade uh, standard of using addition and subtraction within 100 to solve a two or um, one step word problem. Um, so they would code their animal and then I would give them a word problem and they could actually um, create an interactive solution. So they would change their code um, to solve that word problem. Um, so if he was playing outside for X amount of um, time, how hungry would the dog get? Something like that. Um, and so one thing that's interesting and why I enjoy um, splats is I talked about the, the robot. So anthropomorphic um, kind of human nature, that's what it's called, anthropomorphism, um, is giving an attribution to a non, giving like human traits um, to non-human entities. So uh, my students would work with robots and after like a week and a half of working with them, they would give them a name. Um, they would start calling them uh, he or she um, and they would say, oh, like he or she is cranky today if they didn't upload the code um, correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that this is a bad thing, this anthropomorphic um, behavior, However, with splats, um, they don't necessarily see the splat tile um, as that non, that, that human, um, like that humanoid robot, but they are now working with each other. Um, so that's why it promotes that social skill um, a little bit more than I've seen some of the, the robot, um, the, the robot uh, technologies do. Um, and in this case, um, it's just another good example. They would see their dog as their own pet. They'd give it a name and, and things like that. Um, but I do enjoy splats and I'll give you like that pedometer um, challenge between each other. They're now socially interacting with each other, not just with a robot or just with the screen. Yeah, and we actually have a virtual version of that pedometer challenge as well in one of our STEM and fitness activities. And um, we can go over that in a little bit. Yeah, um, this is just one more. We'll run through it quickly, but I'll have the students kind of uh, race each other um, in the classroom, um, obviously safely, um, but starting and stopping at a point and then they will simulate the race um, or we'll go outside and race and then they'll simulate the race on uh, their screen. And there's a bunch of different ways to solve that uh, coding problem. You can see I put a few on the right hand side, but that's that idea. They use looping um, sometimes to, to talk about multiplication. Um, so if I set up a piece of code that um, they're taking 10 steps, but I loop it three times, that's 30 steps to the finish line. 
um, mm -hmm. I'll set up those types of uh, those types of learning environments. That sounds like fun. And uh, last kind of question of the day for those who are brand new and have no computer science experience, and it can be really intimidating, you know, when you talked about not be, it, it not being a big barrier, uh, you know, to incorporate some of this, what are your tips for uh, teachers who are new to this? Yeah, so I think the best um, way to um, jump into an educational setting where you may um, feel like you don't have the knowledge Think of it this way, there's, there's a hierarchy of knowledge in education. Um, now I just apply this to my understanding, but uh, there's a, a lot of different models out there, but teacher educators is PD leaders, let's say for myself, um, I need to understand how teachers are understanding um, this type of content, right? So that's kind of me just on the top, but it's a different knowledge set than what is required of the actual teacher and of the student. Um, you do not need to be an expert in um, everything splat to integrate it into your classroom. I don't, I'm not an expert at all things computer science education. Um, I know that, but I do know the things that I am good at um, in specific activities that I can integrate into my classroom. Um, and I focus on those and I research those to give me a better understanding. We all can't be, um, we all can't be necessarily Swiss army knights. We wanna know a couple um, good things and how to integrate them practically into our content. And that's why that cross-curricular method is great because um, you are already an expert in another type of discipline. Um, and we're not asking you to be an expert in computer science, but we're trying to look at some practical ways. So teachers have their own type of teaching knowledge. Um, so they have their own type of CS teacher knowledge, which is a professional skill. Um, which is why everyone can't just go be a teacher is because you have that, that middle knowledge structure. Um, and that's different than what you need your students to understand, right? So investigating this, um, and it's almost like an epistemology, it's really almost like a self inner search sometimes, um, um, is realizing that you don't have to be an expert to integrate this. Um, you can try it day one and go through different iterations. And I think now I'm gonna go over some actual practical lesson tips, so. Lonnie asked, how about parents? Have you seen any parent parental involvement in, uh, in any of this? Yeah, I mean, for education in general, it's always best if uh, we can tie the parents um, into the learning. Um, I think having access to the technology and, and, and having their parents actually utilize it and send it home, um, it always is going to uh, reward, reward the student um, just because um, it's, it, it's engaging, and if you can get it um, into a family environment, they'll just use it more and have more access to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so the actual, here are some tips I'll give you when you're setting up, after you examine that, that Venn diagram, what content do I wanna teach? What computational thinking standard do I see in the concept and in the block-based programming? Um, here's a way to design an activity that helps you and really targets that middle um, piece of hierarchical knowledge. Um, you can limit your blocks. So you kind of know you can guide your students to different solution pathways, not just one, but maybe I know if I limit my number of blocks, there's only four or five different ways they can solve this problem. And then at the end of the lesson, I can then debrief on the different ways that the problem was solved or the challenge was met. Um, you can create a challenge like I like to do. Um, I think when you create that challenge, add some competition to it is, is a great way. Um, you can place requirements on the code. Um, so you can say you need to use the interval of two, three, or these colors, um, or you can only use, you need like three chunks of code. Um, these are all practical ways to not just, not limiting constructivism, um, but it's, it's giving you a narrow path um, to create a, a more focused learning environment. Um, you can incorporate story problems. I gave you an example with that, with the, uh, the pet. Um, you can provide faulty code. This is called debugging. Um, so you give them an already pre-made program that doesn't work. And you say, hey, like I know how it works. You can say, hey, can you help me figure this out? And then ask them how they made the changes and how um, they actually debugged the program. Um, and then kind of leverage that as a learning opportunity. Um, be practical and then be creative. Um, I think that is, there's already pre-made curriculums out there, which are great. 
Um, but if you understand this process, this uh, pedagogical process, you can then alter them to your students and your classroom needs. Great tips. And then uh, not to push my own research on you, but if you're interested in any of this, I examined how teachers are actually connecting block-based programming, computational thinking, and elementary math. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, I also put a link in here um, just with the abstract and whatnot, um, but I, I'd be more than happy to send this to you um, if you're interested. So just let me know. We will, uh, we will definitely send out the slide deck um, after the webinar so um, they can click that link. Awesome. So uh, Kevin did a great job in the beginning uh, describing splats, but this is what they look like. I've got actually one right here. Um, so there's two types of splats. There's the physical ones that you can stomp on and press. Uh, and then there's virtual splats, which work uh, with iPads and Chromebooks through our app. So I'll just give you a quick look at how it works um, with the video. And let me just make sure I got my sound sharing on and I do. Awesome. See that race in place game very similar to the pedometer. Um, one moment. There we go. <laughs> so, um, you know, as social emotional learning becomes you know more important, especially with virtual learning, uh, we actually developed a virtual SEL activity pack, uh, which the activities are focused around two things: making sure students are learning something and then also having fun and working in that playfulness aspect. Um, and our SEL activity packs are usually focused more so on the collaboration and the, you know, uh, working together to solve a problem, creating those opportunities to work together uh, rather than strictly on the block coding, but um, they're incorporated. So I mentioned that we do have a virtual platform. Um, this is what it looks like. I can hop out um, of the slide deck uh, in a second, just to give a quick example, we had uh, one activity that we did um, over the summer, which is really popular called the found art challenge. Uh, and it looks kind of silly here, but basically what happens is there's a randomizer that um, makes the spot slide up a certain color. Uh, and then students have a certain amount of time to run around the room and grab something that's that color and then bring it to their desk. And then that happens three or four times and then they can create a sculpture from the items um, that are on their desk. So I'm gonna hop out of here and show you uh, what that looks like. So here is our code. Corey, can you see the found art challenge code? I can, yep. Awesome, so uh, <laughs> in the code here, you know, when the program starts, um, you can start it by pressing run, or you can also start a program by pressing the splat. Those two ways to start a program. So right here in this code, it says you start the program by uh, pressing run. And then when you press splat one, it's gonna give you 20 seconds. It's gonna light a random color. Um, and then you're gonna run around the room and find it. And then at the end, once you've done that a number of times, you can press spot two and that's gonna give you 60 seconds to put together your sculpture. So I'm just gonna run it once to see what, to show you what it looks like virtually. And this is something that you could sh screen share with your students on Zoom and then have them run and share their screens and then show their art uh, at the end. And we've had um, students do, or students and teachers do this all virtually. So just gonna press run. You can see that the splats are lit up and now I'm gonna press spot one. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. All right, I won't, <laughs> I won't play the full 20 seconds, but you get the idea. So it does a, count, a verbal countdown, which we've coded um, count out loud. So you can see here, this is our function. And then we have uh, a variable called set count to 20 here as well. So this is, um, this is actually modified code from a, uh, one of our activity packs that we've done, we simplified it a little bit here, but it's just a fun way to kind of mix that playfulness with the code. And uh, one way that you could do this is break students out into groups, um, you know, virtually and have them code different parts of the same game to work together to create that code and then put it all together at the end and play it. 
right. I think Corey has one more activity he wants to share as well. Yeah, I will, uh, I will show you the, the actual pedometer challenge. So you can see, um, this is some slides I even give my students. And so I told you, you can do the four, um, you can differentiate that activity. It, a pedometer can be made with these four blocks. If you, if you take a second look at them, you can kind of figure out maybe how um, that would happen. Um, you give yourself that event um, trigger, which is a computational thinking concept that, that kind of triggers the code to happen. When the program starts, you would place that countdown button in that when program starts button. And then when the plat is, the splat is clicked, um, it would increase the score by one. So let me share my screen really quickly. Um, Sharing. <clears throat> grab this. So just so you see, can you see that now, Lauren? Yep. Can you see me still? I sure can. Okay. We're going to try a live demonstration here. We'll see if it works. <laughs> um, let's see if we can do it. Okay, so um, we have this chair out of the way. So you can see this uh, this program on the left hand side. You can try to understand it, but uh, um, if you play with it a little bit, you can see it's that idea that when you the program starts, it'll start counting down from ten, and then you have an if then statement. So um, if the stopwatch is um, less than 0.1, which means it's pretty much over, um, then a buzzer sound will, will happen. Um, and the splats will light up. You can turn them on. I'll show you how easy it is to connect them. Um, so we have splats one and two. Uh, you can use an actual desktop application with splat that will run it. There we go. So they are both connected. Um, the splat one and two, you can put them on the ground. And once I click run, let's make sure. Let me just make sure they're connected. And okay, and then I click run. So I can, I don't think I have my left. Can give me one second? There we go. Okay. So now when I click run, start, I can use my pedometer. And when the time actually runs out. And you can see the numbers going up too. <laughs> 15 seconds. There you go. And so um, just to give you an example about how easy they are to connect to your actual online platform, um, but also run this type of code, it's, this same code can be run with those four same blocks. So um, I hope that gives you kind of a, an in-person example. And you can take the screen back and we can go down. And then it looks like you've got some extensions here as well. Yes, so um, these are some different ways that you can differentiate that challenge. Um, it kind of applies the um, tips that I, that I gave you. We limited the number of blocks there. Um, and then this is the, the challenge I will give them. Try to create an existing pedometer um, with multiple color lights, LEDs. So I'm giving them kind of uh, um, requirements on that code. And then when stepped on, the they change rainbow colors. And then when the 10 second timer runs out, it turns red. So those are the requirements I placed on the code. Um, awesome. And I know we're running low on time and I wanna leave some time for questions, but just really quickly, you have one more example here. Um, oh, it looks like actually this is the same code, but you just incorporated all the rainbow colors. Yep, yeah, that just goes with the, uh, the requirements I had, but the solution is there as well. Um, Nice. And these are just some ways that you could change that um, program where you could um, maybe make it a challenge between uh, two students or you could you could have like a tug of war. So if you step on your splats or run faster, it will take points away from another set. Um, things like that. They, there's different ways that you can extend these, these projects. Yeah, and we have a ton of built-in games into the app. I think Corey mentioned too, you wanna to start out with one. Uh, to get students familiar with, you know, the rules for the game are the rules for the code, we always say, and then modifications are the are a great next step. 
So this is one that's a bit, you know, a bit more simple, red light, green light, everybody knows what it is. Uh, and the rules are simple. When it's red, you're stopped. And when it's green, you're going. And so one virtual sort of modification for this is to have your students on screen running in place. They don't need to have the splats um, while it's green. And then when it's red, they can pose, uh, make a silly pose and freeze. And then you can make up all sorts of rules. Like, you know, if they move, then you need to do five jumping jacks, something like that, but just something fun uh, that gets students moving and breaks up the day. Um, we have a hybrid learning guide that includes a bunch of socially distanced um, games, as well as tips for how to take existing games that were meant to be in person and, and make them a little bit more distant. So um, that's all up on our website, uh, as well as a bunch of virtual resources that we made over the summer, including a Morse code activity pack, uh, the social emotional learning one that I mentioned, um, musical splats one, which used MIDI to assign um, notes to splats, which is a great virtual one. And then we also have a, uh, a specifically fitness focused one. All right, so here's our website. If you're interested in checking it out, my name is Lauren. I got my email up on the screen as well. If you have any uh, questions, uh, please feel free to email me, but I wanna make sure that we give a few minutes uh, for questions. Great, well, <clears throat> thanks Lauren. Thanks Corey for a really, a, a really interesting presentation. And the, the back and forth, I thought, was terrific with, with the audience members. Uh, you guys know how to work that chat function pretty well. <laughs> yeah, we got a ton, yeah. of, uh, a ton of great ideas, too. And it looks like people are already incorporating computer science into yeah. their use, so that's encouraging. I know there's uh, a, a question, uh, Kevin, sorry, on uh, um, more about splats, the cost, and the platform um, that you can answer to, Lauren, I see in there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's gonna depend on how many splats we have a number of different membership plans and sort of how it works is the uh, warranty for the splats, uh, the hardware are totally built in as well as ongoing support for you and anybody else in your building. So we don't charge for seats or extra training, uh, that's all included. So uh, if you're interested in getting a quote, you know, uh, let me know, email me. And uh, I'd be happy to um, kind of get to know your needs a little bit more and then uh, work out a plan for you. Great. And while it does seem that we hit all of the, uh, the questions in case we'll, we'll go through the, uh, the transcript here. And if you submitted a question that we didn't get to, uh, someone from Unruly will follow up with you directly. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our presenters today for a very informative presentation. And I'd like to thank all the audience members for, for joining us as well. As a reminder, you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to this recording along with the slides. Thanks again for participating and have a great day. Thanks for having us. Thank thanks you everyone so for joining. Yeah, thank you.